Joining me now is Robert Reich, former U.S. Labor Secretary under President Bill Clinton and author of the new book, The Common Good. So Robert, let's talk about your thesis in this new book. What is wrong with politics right now? Well, what's wrong with politics right now uh, is very similar to what's wrong with the economy. That is, you've got a breakdown, a complete breakdown in the norms of behavior, uh, the expectations of what someone in politics is supposed to be doing and why uh, for 30 years. In fact, this is really the culmination of 30 years of, of deterioration uh, in what had been the assumed political and social and economic norms uh, to the point where now anything is uh, okay. You, you know, whatever it takes to win is the new norm. And that is very dangerous because it ignores the institutions and processes that constitute our democracy. Uh, and this is an issue that both Democrats and Republicans need to acknowledge, right? Yes. Uh, as I make sure in the book, and I make, I go to great pains to, uh, to point out, uh, this is a problem for both Democrats and Republicans. I don't mean to engage in false equivalency here, uh, because I am a Democrat. I think the Democrats have, on the policies, uh, done a better job than Republicans. But we're not talking about policies. We're talking about uh, how these parties and the major people in the parties exercising leadership respond to their duties to the institutions and the processes of democracy. And there has been a steady breakdown in the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party. This loss of common good goes beyond politics. You have a timeline in the book of certain examples from Carl Icahn's hostile takeover of TWA in 1985 to Michael Milken's conviction in 1990 to more recently the Wells Fargo scandal. Is there a common good on Wall Street? No, I think the common good is completely gone. I think if you asked Wall Street executives what's the common good, they would be very hard pressed to talk about it. They would say something about, well, making a profit is the common good. That's absurd. Uh, I mean, you know, 40 years ago, uh, people on Wall Street understood that there were institutional constraints that were not written in the Securities and Exchange Act, but they were norms about how bankers and people in the financial sector should behave. Now, there were obvious people who did not pay attention to those norms. Uh, there were bad apples. But basically, there was a set of accepted uh, principles that people operated by. Uh, when the uh, unfriendly takeovers broke out in the 1980s, uh, those principles changed somewhat. In fact, they changed in some very important ways. I'm not suggesting that Carl Icahn or anybody else who engaged in unfriendly takeovers uh, did anything illegal. But up until that point, hostile takeovers were, uh, were, were broke the norm. I mean, uh, some people at that time, Michael Jensen and others, uh, Michael Jensen at Harvard Business School, for example, thought that unfriendly takeovers were making the economy more efficient. Well, now, looking back on what has happened over the past 40 years, I think it's fair to say uh, that although there were some efficiency gains, the ancillary costs to the economy have been huge in terms of communities abandoned, employees uh, basically feeling that the game is rigged against them. Many working people who have seen stagnant or declining wages for decades. And I believe that that set of actions, uh, unfriendly takeovers, hostile, hostile takeovers uh, uh, financed by junk bonds, uh, began a serious, serious negative direction for the country and for our financial institutions. Although we did see some common good with the recently passed tax cuts, a lot of critics said, don't give corporate America a tax break. They're just going to use it for buybacks and dividends. But we actually saw dozens of big time companies raise wages, give bonuses to their employees and invest in their employees. So do those factors encourage you? No, because the if you compare the amount of buyback to the amount of corporate uh, Let's let's assume that we're talking about wage increases and 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 training. Uh, it is the ratio is is absurd. I mean, buybacks are on track to be eight hundred billion dollars this year. There was a huge increase in corporate buybacks. Uh, the extent of corporate raises for employees 
and corporate training is just a tiny, tiny fraction of those buybacks. But still, a $1,000 bonus to a lot of people is a big deal. Well, a $1,000 bonus is indeed a big deal, and if that maintains itself, that'll be fine. But a bonus is not a wage increase. A bonus is a one-time event. Uh, and some of those bonuses may have been uh, designed to create the impression that there was going to be a big payout to employees uh, so that they were done up front in January. Uh, but don't fool yourself. Uh, a bonus is not a wage increase. So when it comes to the loss of common good, as you argue, on Wall Street and in politics, is there a fix? Well, there's no easy fix, because if it's a legislative fix, you can't get the political power to do it if everybody is basically working for themselves or if your politicians are taking campaign contributions, which might be called bribes, in order to do the bidding of the big, uh, big moneyed interests that give them those bribes. Uh, no, what we do need to do is revive fundamentally our understanding of leadership in America. That's why in the book I talk about leadership as trusteeship. If you are an executive, a powerful executive of a major corporation or a bank, or you are a senator or a member of Congress, or if you're in a state legislature, you have, or if you're a governor or president of the United States, you have institutional responsibilities to make sure that people trust the institutions that you are and have responsibility for more when you leave than the level of trust was when you took over. And unfortunately, that trusteeship notion of leadership uh, has been it's completely forgotten. Uh, in fact, uh, most people assume that their leadership responsibility is to, if they're in the private sector, uh, just make more money. Uh, for their institution for themselves, or if they're in the public sector, just accumulate more power uh, for their party or for themselves. Robert, as former U.S. Labor Secretary, what's your reaction to President Trump's tariff plans, which is an attempt by the administration to save and create jobs in the steel and aluminum industries, which have been decimated over the past few years? Well, the effect is going to be just the opposite. Uh, number one, uh, when we have tried to do these unilateral tariffs in the past, we have ignited very often trade wars. Uh, others are trading partners. They retaliate against us. Europe is now in the process of getting ready for retaliation against several major American exports. That's going to hurt jobs. Secondly, all the downstream users in the United States of steel and aluminum and we're talking about appliance manufacturers, auto manufacturers, everybody else who uses steel and aluminum in their products. Now they have to pay more than their international competitors have to pay for the steel and aluminum they use in their products, which makes American products less competitive and hurts and jeopardizes American jobs. Uh, and finally, you have the loss of American, really the, a threat really to American uh, foreign policy and American security. Uh, these tariffs were put in place ostensibly because of American security interests. Uh, but that is just absurd. Our biggest imports of steel and aluminum come from Canada. And the last time we worried about Canada as a security threat to the United States uh, was probably in the early 18th century. Yeah, but we know that China overproduces steel and aluminum and that kind of floods the market and brings down the costs for everyone. Their steel also enters the U.S. through other countries. Yes, but if we're talking about dumping, there are particular laws and procedures we have to respond to dumping uh, at prices that are under the price of production. And if China is doing that, we could retaliate or uh, do some specific, make some very specific a scalpel-like moves with regard to China. But to set tariffs on steel and aluminum all over the world coming into the United States is a uh, blunderbust. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's going to come back, I'm afraid, and hurt American workers. The tariff announcement seemed to have caused the departure of Gary Cohn from the White House. What was your reaction to that? Uh, well, I, you know, having worked in and around uh, three different White Houses, one Republican and two Democratic White Houses, uh, 
I, generally speaking, uh, applaud people who leave out of principle if they make it very clear why they're leaving. And the threshold has got to be very, very high. Ordinarily, I mean, I know when I was Secretary of Labor, I, dis I had a lot of disputes with the White House, a lot of things that Bill Clinton and others in his White House uh, made it happen or supported that I did not support, but I still didn't resign out of protest because they didn't reach the level uh, of principle that I thought was really at stake. Gary Cohn, well, obviously he felt this was a very important principle, but he now has some obligation, it seems to me, to speak out, not just to resign and have nobody know why he resigned. That's the worst of all worlds. You know, Robert, when we talk about tariffs and trade, it brings up globalization, but there's another threat on the horizon, artificial intelligence, which will ultimately be a bigger threat to jobs in your view? Artificial intelligence will have a much bigger, is already uh, automation and uh, technology and then artificial intelligence already having a much bigger effect uh, on jobs and uh, consequent, consequential job losses than globalization. Uh, and I'm not a neo-Luddite. I don't suggest that we go out and we stop artificial intelligence. That would be absurd. But we do need to be ready. We need to understand that the issue ultimately is not the number of jobs. I mean, we will probably have as many jobs uh, as we have now if we handle the macroeconomic policies correctly, that is, fiscal and monetary policies. That, those are the things that determine the number of jobs. But the quality of the jobs, what they pay, is really the issue here. And artificial intelligence is probably going to reduce the median wage, certainly for the bottom 60 or 70 percent of American workers, uh, because they are, don't have the education, they don't have the training, they don't have the capacity and won't have, given the rate at which artificial intelligence is being introduced, uh, to be able to improve their productivity faster than artificial intelligence is displacing them from their jobs. Uh, so it's, a, it's going to be a huge problem. Over the next eight years, we're likely to see four and a half million people who are involved in driving occupations, I'm talking about truck drivers and other drivers, lose their jobs because of self-driving cars. What do we have in place to make sure that they don't fall into poverty, even though they may be working? Nothing. Well, then what do you make of the overall labor market right now? We're seeing about 200,000 jobs added to the economy every month. We have another jobs report on Friday. Investors will be watching for wage growth. What do you think? Well, again, the issue is not the number of jobs. I mean, that's good. I'm very glad that we are maintaining a high number of jobs, although we still have a huge number of people who are of working age who are too discouraged to look for work or for other reasons they're out of the job market. But let me just say the number of jobs is not what I worry about over the long term. What I worry about over the long term is the quality of the jobs. And over the last 30 years, adjusted for inflation, the median wage has gone almost nowhere. If we are going to see and beginning to see some growth in the median wage, that's great. But that's more of a cyclical phenomenon than it is a structural phenomenon. It has to do with the expansion that presumably is already con is, is continuing. All right, Robert Reich, former U.S. Labor Secretary under President Bill Clinton and author of The Common Good. Fascinating conversation. Thanks very much for joining me. Well, thank you very much, Scott.